to thank all the people who helped out in the in the dining room. Um, some of them are right here, and, and others aren't. But uh, I, for one, appreciate what what you all did and make it possible. I'm going to go through a couple of things. Uh, I didn't. I deliberately did not give you the my f larger list of citizen assets, which can be considered tools of democracy. Because so I wanted you to think about it. Anybody come up with any more? Uh, it's, it's a hard thing to define. I mean, you can almost say uh, citizen assets, every one of us. I mean, <laughs> you want to define it that broadly. But let me suggest a couple. The Freedom of Information Act is a citizen <coughs> asset. That, that has blown apart a lot of government secrecy and led to a lot of major media coverage. A lot of what the New York Times puts on page one uh, or 60 Minutes had their roots in uh, freedom of information. It blew apart the... Uh, the tobacco deception and lies, uh, and, uh, and it worked to get more information out on asbestos and the cover-up back in the 30s. Uh, it helped us get the meat and poultry inspection laws through in the late 70s. We got the inspection reports, and they were pretty disgusting by the Department of Agriculture of meat and poultry plants, which the department didn't want to publicize because they're very cushy with the industry. Um, and we, there are just huge amounts of information, and it's still only the tip of the iceberg. If there was a group of 20 people whose only job was filing Freedom of Information Acts, they would dig deeper and deeper. It's endless, absolutely endless, great material in, in government uh, files. And, and uh, if, uh, if they don't give it to you and they violate the law, it's the only law that has a mild sanction on the government bureaucrat. They can be suspended for 30 days uh, if you take them to court. And it's a very rare sanction, but it, it does set a precedent that if they don't respond to you, uh, they can be mildly uh, penalized. And you all have that uh, booklet, don't you, the Freedom Information booklet? Yeah, okay, or a little pamphlet uh, on how to get it done. And <clears throat> the more we can get people to use it, by, by writing a letter to a state agency or local agency or federal, the more they, they use it to get um, the minutes of advisory committees under Advisory Committee Act, the more they uh, challenge uh, secret public meetings, which are under uh, certain state laws and federal laws, are supposed to be open, um, <clears throat> the more involved they get. It's a good, it's a good doorway uh, to get people involved in the, the process of uh, self-government. Yes? And people can go to foiamachine.com and they'll do all the work for you. You just oh. pick the agency and what you want. Right. They'll send the request. Look at that. I didn't know about that. Foiamachine.com. F-O-I-A. Who started that? FOIA machine. F-O-I-A machine.com. Or dot org. I don't know which. Or dot org. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea who started it. We use it all the time. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's easy to ask for something, but if you don't ask for it specifically, uh, they can e either give you a, a ton of stuff, or they can say, we don't have it. So yeah, you've got to contour the request in the letter in a way of what you ask. Like when we went uh, after the FAA to, to divulge its information on the supersonic transport, which one professor at Harvard led the way to block. And the French and, and British were left with the Concorde. And we, we didn't get the supersonic uh, transport in, in this country, heavily subsidized, by the way, and a real environmental threat. Uh, he took it on, and we filed a FOIA. And uh, they wrote back saying, we can't find what you're looking for. I mean, we have warehouses full of material. And that led to a judicial decision that forced all the agencies to index their materials better so that they couldn't uh, avoid responding to you by saying, you know, uh, we're going to have to charge you by the hour. And, and they will charge you by the hour unless you can show that you're going to use it for a demonstrated public purpose, not for commercial purpose. And so it's always good to ha have uh, FOIAs unless they're really simple FOIAs, uh, to be filed by nonprofit groups, because they usually get the exemption. 
It's just almost automatic. <clears throat> so the FOIA is a civic asset and a tool of democracy. How about the uh, Federal False Claims Act? Tens of billions of dollars recovered uh, from corporate predations on the taxpayer uh, by whistleblowers. And some of them made out pretty well after going through uh, very serious uh, adversities. But that's, uh, that, that, that's never underutilized. You can keep utilizing it. And by the way, the chief champion of the 1986 False Claims Act, fighting off the hordes from the corporate behemoths who want to get rid of it for obvious reasons. They want to continue to rip off government Medicare and Pentagon contracts is Republican Charles Grassley, senator from Iowa, the new chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Far, far better than any other Democrat on this issue. And one of the reasons he's so good is he was in at the beginning uh, when it was enacted, and he teamed up with Democrat Howard Berman from California in the House, and it was Grassley on the right, Berman on the left, to get through this extremely innovative uh, citizen initiative uh, instrument of accountability. So there you are, right there, another example of left-right. Uh, here's another one. How about certain laws? Um, you know, let's say you, you have a, a contaminated meat problem or a contaminated water, drinking water problem. You go to the Drinking Water Act of 1974, which we got through, against some opposition by local water officials. Can you imagine that? I mean, it was horrible. We sent a a young engineer around the, the local drinking water. Uh, uh, he went to Cleveland, h horribly under uh, invested in, in drinking water facilities, drinking water purification facilities. He went to uh, New Orleans. He had a terrible experience in New Orleans. Uh, there was a, a, a contamination uh, problem in New Orleans from the Mississippi River, and the officials took offense at being criticized. It's like, how dare you criticize our drinking water? One of them said to the press, there are a lot more dangerous things you can do in New Orleans than drink the drinking water. And on his way out, after he interviewed uh, the, the official in charge of New Orleans drinking water, the, the, the man said, and by the way, uh, where are you go you're going back to your boss, Nader? And he said, yeah. And he said, will you tell Nader that he can kiss my ass? This is a public official. So if you think some of these things are slam dunk legislation, <laughs> there's always someone uh, opposing them for a reason that you never thought would be the case. It turns out they were helped by government funding and upgrading uh, some of the purification systems. And uh, as we know, it's an, uh, that... That's a never-ending battle because you've got to deal with the pipes, the feeder pipes that go into the homes, the leaching. Uh, however, you, you, you can get regular reports on your drinking water under the Federal Drinking Water Act. They have to file them, and so you can go down in your town, in your city, and you can get the report, and they'll tell you if there's any l permissible levels of arsenic or lead or E. coli or, or, or whatever. Most people don't know that and they have, to, they have to give it to you. So there are a number of laws that uh, can be t uh, tools. How about tort law? Here's where you, you're, you're wrongfully injured, uh, and you can file a case. And uh, unlike other professionals, the lawyers that take your case only charge you when they win. Wouldn't you like to have a doctor like that? <laughs> so... Uh, and we're starting the first uh, law museum in America. We have no law museum in America. Rule of law, America. Uh, we're starting it in Connecticut, an American Museum of Tort Law. And in doing the research, uh, I learned that there were 32 timber and lumber museums. There's a garlic museum, a nut museum. There's every sport as a museum, vegetables, uh, museums. Is that there's uh, 19th century lantern museums, uh, the, the, the thousands of museums, but not a museum 
on law of any kind. There's an exhibit at the American Bar Association. Uh, that's not a uh, museum. And the reason is to stream out an educational process from the museum, uh, teaching people about just how important jury duty is and how wonderful experience it's been for uh, people who've gone through it. And they shouldn't shirk it. In Washington, D.C., 70% of the summons are thrown away by people, and they're never penalized. 70%, just like that. Don't have time for a major institution, a major tool uh, of, uh, <coughs> of, of democracy. Yeah, if you look at uh, the successes uh, against asbestos, against tobacco, uh, against uh, contracting fraud, against a whole series of products we all buy, uh, you'll find more often than not their roots are in a lawsuit filed by a plaintiff with a contingent fee lawyer, digging up the material, get, getting it in the media, getting it through the courts, etc. Uh, I got with Senator Nelson the tire safety law through, and I brought to him in the Senate in 1966 a whole slew of information about inadequate testing, defective tires uh, from the uh, big tire companies uh, based on uh, two product liability suits uh, represented inj injured people. And uh, he, he translated that into legislation. The act itself has problems in enforcement and all, but <clears throat> I mean, it's good that it got through and it helped get through the, the larger motor vehicle and highway safety laws uh, about the same time that Lyndon Johnson uh, signed. Uh, how about this one? Pension funds and mutual funds. We are supposed to be controlling those. Workers are supposed to control the pension funds and investors are supposed to control the mutual funds. They're called mutual for a reason. However, just like any other large institutions, the management has taken control against the owners, just like they do the management of corporations have taken control from the owners, but they haven't taken control legally. It's just they've concentrated power as a de facto. And um, I mentioned to Arthur that the, my classmate at Harvard Law School is semi-retired now, Robert Monks in Maine. He's the main, uh, the leading shareholder, writes advocates, written books on it. He's a multimillionaire. He's been on boards of directors. He's built businesses. So he, he looks at it from the inside as well as out. He's a severe critic of corporations, but he's also a severe critic of mutual funds and pension funds because they are the big shareholders, aren't they? I mean, between mutual funds like Fidelity, Vanguard, uh, Teachers Fund, and between the big pension funds, probably 65, 70% ownership of the top 500 corporations in the country. And what he is saying is that the managers of these funds are violating their fiduciary duty to their investors and their shareholders and not being aggressive um, deployment of their power to hold big corporations accountable, like ExxonMobil or Pfizer or Citibank or Bank of America or Prudential, which is now converted from mutual uh, uh, to stock. And uh, he would be a very good person for a weekend uh, uh, here because he... He talks from being an insider, and he's written a lot of good books, and one of them, the least, latest one is Corpocracy. Corpocracy, it's off of bureaucracy. Um, then I figured out this one. Uh, I was a shareholder of, of Cisco, and Cisco kept buying back stock, not giving shareholders any dividends. So I called up one of the top officials, and I said, who owns you? And he said, the shareholders. I said, why are you not giving them dividends? You're making profit every year. He said, well, we, we prefer to do uh, uh, stock buybacks and acquisitions. I said, but who are you? You're a hired hand. I said, we're going to get you to give dividends. And so I thought up this idea, the penny brigade. And, and just think of the, the numbers here. There are trillions of shares, right? Trillions of shares outstanding, all these companies. If the owners of 10 billion shares 
just 10 billion shares, donated a penny a share. Okay, you, you own GM, you own uh, Bank of America. <clears throat> a penny of share for just 10 billion shares. Now, Cisco has 5 billion shares, just that one company. One cent, 10 billion, will hire 500 full-time watchdogs, one on each of the 500 corporations at $100,000 a year. And uh, so I went on cable, and I got some people, you know, one guy had 10,000 shares, okay, I'll give you, you know, $100 and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, Cisco got a little concerned. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm going to your shareholders meeting. And so I called up one of the officials there, who happened to have been my intern, <laughs> many, many years ago. And I said, Mark, we're coming after you. <laughs> he said, we're discussing it inside, and we're trying to figure out about how we're going to do stock buybacks. I said, do not do stock buybacks anymore. $65 billion in stock payments could have gone back to the shareholders, the pension funds. So, well, to make a long story short, they announced uh, a 3% dividend. And then they went up to 3.2% dividend. It took a long time for Microsoft and, uh, and uh, EMC and <coughs> Apple just to do dividends. When Microsoft announced dividends, Retail sales in Seattle perceptibly increased. So it's a way of, you know, stimulating consumer demand. And if you're part of a pension fund, it's a way of restoring the adequacy of your pension fund. But stock buybacks are just destructive. And if you hear Robert Monks on stock buybacks, he's devastating on how it's entirely done to sh shore up executive compensation at, at the top. We'll get you some water. Okay. okay. So that's the pension funds, mutual funds, trillions of dollars. The penny brigade. All right, now here's another as asset. Are you ready for this one? Funerals are a civic asset. Funerals are among America's wasting assets. Here's a typical funeral or memorial. There's the music, there's the flowers, the reverend or what, whatever clergy usually introduces it. If it's a more secular memorial, the, the relatives come up and speak, and then the friends come up and speak, and the speak are usually are memories of the bereaved and uh, of the deceased, and some anecdotes. And so the, the audience, you know, sort of politely chuckles, and, and then they end with an organ, and they stream out with the family first, and they go to a reception, and it's over. <coughs> Why is it over? Why can't there be life after death on earth? Well, let me give you an example. David Halberstam, how many of you have heard of him? Okay, he was my boyhood chum in elementary school, and he survived the Congo, and he survived Vietnam, and he survived the civil rights struggles in the South, and he gave a speech one day to a journalism school in Berkeley, uh, and he was driven back to his motel by a very reckless student who had already violated uh, 
the traffic safety laws in, in his prior months, and he took a left turn illegally, and an oncoming car came and hit the right side where David was uh, seated, and, and he died. So this is about four, three, four years ago. So they had a memorial service for him in Riverside Church, which I attended. It was packed. You know, publishers, uh, publishing agents, media moguls, tons of reporters, prize winners, families, and they went through the process. They gave anecdotes, they talked about his bravery, they talked about his books, talked about his kindness, and then we went to a reception. It was a little drizzling out in the courtyard, so it wasn't that full. And then it was over. And the question is, I asked is, why is it over? So I got a, a week of journalistic buddies of his at Wesleyan in the summer uh, to, uh, in effect, pay tribute to him by talking to journalism students, and did they ever uh, let their hair down. Uh, all self-censorship was it just disappeared because they were talking about a fearless journalist. That's how they paid tribute to him. About the trouble they had, the struggles they had, the people they covered, how they were maneuvered or tried to be maneuvered. So I, I thought, you know, at least that would be a nice tribute. Okay, so here are the assets. Everybody who passes away can be an occasion to start a fellowship, a grant, a garden program. There's a woman very famous who passed away in Philadelphia. She was known as the gardener of Philadelphia. Flowers and places reserved in the metropolis for trees and shrubbery. And she was in the New York Times, she was prominent, obituary, nothing afterwards. I, we had a, f a friend who's an accountant, and he was an ingenious accountant in the sense of his values. And he would, for example, meet with the IRS and a client. And he would say to the IRS agent, and, and his client, he used to say the following, I am here to represent the IRS, and you, IRS agent, are here to represent my client. That's the kind of man he was. When he passed away, a thousand people filled a church. We suggested to the family that they use this occasion to have an award in his name for accounting courage. Uh, you know, the, the accounting firm needs that. The accounting profession needs that very rapidly. I mean, they're, they're the big cover-up uh, on the Wall Street rackets, for example. And, but they were too, just too concerned, obviously, with the funeral. And, and it wasn't on their radar because they had other things uh, more serious claiming their time and and it didn't happen if it doesn't happen right away it's hard to happen he could have lived on through that award and the people who got that award would have been fortified in their courageous action so look at the people who recently passed away and as far as I know, nothing was done in their name. Okay? John Kenneth Galbraith. I called up some of his sons. I called up his biographer. Their, their statement was, there is no money to start a John Kenneth Galbraith Institute of Progressive Economics. Even though he was a huge best-selling author for years, nobody was willing to take it on or anything else in his name. William Sloan Coffin. How many people have heard of him? Great uh, chaplain at Yale, uh, peace advocate, civil rights, got arrested again and again, opponent of the Vietnam War. 
I called him up in his later stages of cancer. I did the last interview of him. And I said, how are you doing? He said, well, better than expected, and the rest is commentary. <laughs> uh, before I called him up, his friends had a huge uh, gathering in his honor, I think at Riverside Church. And after he passed away, nothing. Nothing in the name of this great man. No institution, no award, no fellowship, no instruction to the young, no summer camp, nothing. Senator Proxmire, Senator Nelson, two very popular senators with huge followings around the country, passed away, called up their widows. One was concerned uh, trying to find a, a library space for his records at the University of Wisconsin. It's important to do that. And uh, the other widow was, she was not in a situation to do anything about it. It shouldn't be up to the survivors. It should be up to the friends. And he had many friends, many staffers, and people working in the Senate office building and back home could have had a great institution. What's the model? The Wellstone Institute. When Paul Wellstone died with his wife in that plane crash, his deficient plane and everything else about it, the, the children immediately took proper advantage of the huge outpouring of grief and big turnout in the gym, and they started the, Paul, the Wellstone Institute to train civic activists. And it's, it's doing very well. See, he lives on. The family lives on. Ben Bradley just died in the Washington Post. Heard of Ben Bradley, the editor? They had a huge gathering. They filled the Washington Cathedral. And the usual anecdotes, the stories, the encomiums. I write a letter to the Post, and I say, you know, he has enough admirers at high levels, <laughs> you know, with money and prestige to set up uh, a Ben Bradley Institute against censorship, let's say. Just an example of many. It was a one-paragraph letter. They didn't bother printing it, so I sent it to Donald Graham just a few days ago. Just think. It's not going to work a year from now. It works in the immediate compassion period of memory. One more. Robin Williams. He passed away, huge outpouring in San Francisco at his memorial service. I mean, you could think of all kinds of things, you know, to set up in his name. Last one, when Ludwig von Mises died, the right-wing free speech, I mean, free market person that I, I discuss uh, in my book, Unstoppable, his followers set up a Ludwig von Mises Institute in a southern state. It has trained thousands of young student economists, and it has produced hundreds of books and pamphlets. Clearly, he lives on. So the recommendation basically is this. Three million people die every year. Almost every one of them could have something left in his, her name uh, to enrich the community doesn't have to be very fancy at times. It could be a collection in a library or something like that. It could be a, um, a yearly event to celebrate uh, repair, people who repair the community, the plumbers, electricians, carpenters. Let's say it was a carpenter who passed away. Have a dinner honoring them, okay? and they come together for the first time and talk about interesting uh, things. That's a way to enrich our democracy. So that's a wasting asset that can be brought together. My recommendation is to start a group that facilitates that, because in the stages of bereavement, people aren't ready to do that. And they have to change their culture to begin with and change the customs and so on. You remember Jessica Mitford wrote this book, The American Way of Death. Well, there's an American way of funerals. 
uh, that's in a rut in terms of the potential to to pardon of the what dead poet society yeah that's right with Robin Williams yeah so that uh, if you think about this uh, a lot of the mechanics will be done by the, by this group or this the a few groups around the country now you see where a billionaire comes in again I mean what would it take to set up a few of these groups around the country and get a new rhythm and a new expectation uh, because it goes with the wishes, doesn't it, of the bereaved? I mean, you're not, you're not contrary. You, it's what Clyde Cluckholm, the anthropologist, said. If you want to change society, try to flow with the normal rhythms of the culture and stretch it. So that's just another asset. Anyway, it's good to talk about assets because it, all the assets empower people. They, they, they make people think they're not powerless. They make them think they've got tools to work with and they learn the tools <clears throat> and pretty soon you got changes that stick and, and uh, which is what we want we don't want episodic changes that then are 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 rolled back uh, someone wanted to uh, have me say a few words about uh, corporate uh, regulation and internal uh, corporate uh, you know all the GM recalls uh, of uh, the, the, the ignition switch and I mean I think they've recalled 12 million cars already or so I wrote the head of GM Mary Barra because she was saying we're going to change things and she went before the Senate and said that and you know no more business as usual and the problem is they're not set up uh, to protect confidentially the whistleblowing internally in GM by conscientious engineers. And so they shut up. They know about these problems earlier than anybody else. Even before the assembly line, they know about them at the design stage. And so I said, why don't you set up an internal ombudsman office, direct line to the CEO to take confidential revelations by staff and engineers protect the confidentiality so they're not retaliated against or fired and a direct duty to send that information to the CEO and to the Department of Transportation that would have that would have done it instead what they did they appointed a new vice president for safety same old bureaucratic hierarchy Well, I don't know. I can't answer that. Uh, they, they would have to go against their rhythm of hierarchical bureaucratic uh, process. And GM is the hardest company I've ever met to change its bureaucracy. I mean, it's gotten into trouble for exactly the same reasons they got in trouble <clears throat> in the 60s. It's all passing the buck. I mean, at least she gave us some imagery about how they have meetings in GM and through various facial uh, expressions uh, one is passing the buck one <laughs> you know vertical passing the buck horizontal passing the buck nobody was, wants to take responsibility the traditional ways of regulating corporations one regulation okay you set standards enforce them safety standards financial standards second litigation people sue companies sue each other consumers sue companies American Express you know insurance companies banks whatever manufacturers so you have regulation you have litigation you have competition that's an informal form of regulation when Allstate went first with airbags they began pushing uh, the other insurance companies and pushing the auto insurance the auto industry itself why did all state push airbags one man the guy at the top arch bow thought that was consistent with the insurance industry's duty called loss prevention you prevent injuries so you don't have to pay for the results and uh, 
competition, uh, when it comes in, like Volvo was the first company to put three-point seat belts in, and they sold in this country. And I used Volvo to impeach the nonsense that came out of General Motors saying that seat belts were not desirable because it will rip out your innards in a sudden deceleration in a collision, right? You hit the, you hit the tree, and then you're going forward, and the seat belt is restricting your personal freedom, and <laughs> your kidneys and liver rip out, right? I'm not kidding you. They were saying that. So I said, unless GM can prove that the anatomy of Swedes is different than the anatomy of Americans, they better try another one. So competition is very important. The greatest company I've come across, Interface Corporation, Ray Anderson, uh, biggest carpet tile manufacturer in the world out of Atlanta, Georgia. He died a couple years ago, cancer. And I wrote a column, and he was a giant. He went to a lecture by Paul Hawkins. Look how it starts. Paul Hawkins was a businessman who wrote a book called The Ecology of Industry, trying to get industry to show it's cheaper, better, more profitable, et cetera, to do it right in terms of uh, removing pollution and getting recycling and all. And he went back to his company, 1994, and he said, here's what we're going to do. Every year, we're going to cut our expenses by decreasing our pollution and by decreasing, by increasing our recycling. And by 2020, we're going to be zero. We will give back what we take out of this planet. We're going to be zero. 100% recycling, zero net pollution. And every year, he moved closer. So he was starting to lease, lease carpet tiles, you know, bring them back. And unfortunately, his life was cut short. He wrote two great books. I mean, you want to read books by an industrialist on making peace with the planet? He called himself a recovering plunderer of the earth. And when you heard him speak, he was like an engineering environmental, environmental engineering professor with his feet on the ground. He's the one, by the way, who persuaded second level uh, executives of Walmart that if they reduced their packaging and if they changed their packaging, they could save hundreds of millions of dollars. And to the extent that Walmart, apart from their low wage policy, uh, is doing a lot of recycling and pre-cycling, was due to his work. He would make 100 speeches a year all over. His name is Ray Anderson. Interface Corp. You go to interface.com. I N T E R F A C E. So we have. It's the same thing Dave Freeman is is recommending for getting renewal, renewable. Yeah, it's the same thing. Dave Freeman is going for 100% renewable and efficiency. I mean, he said, don't fiddle around with a percent here or two. We got to convert this. The planet can't wait. It, we know how to do it. It's being done here, it's being done there. It's just a matter of scale. Let's get it underway. Um, so you have regulation, litigation, competition. Another way is investor power. And you know, the clergy has bought uh, shares and they go and they try to get uh, arms control and resolutions in a variety of ways, uh, civil rights, and, uh, and they've had some impact. But, you know, they just have a few shares, and they have moral authority when they stand up at the shareholders' meeting. Uh, the big changes can come when, from the mutual funds and the pension funds get moving. The California Teachers Retirement Fund is in the vanguard. They've done some interesting things, uh, but or they've pulled out uh, of, of companies uh, by way of dissent. Uh, that doesn't make the companies very happy. But we've got a long way to go uh, on that. Whistleblower protection. Ralph, I have a quick question yeah. on that uh, one SPT question. We 
you say it's better to actually own shares, even a few shares, and actually try to be an activist with that, or better to just for like CalPERS of Harvard, for example, just to divest, so to speak, out of coal, natural gas, oil, or is it better to have something than say, we want you to change? You can do both, depending on what your state in life is. If you don't want to be an activist shareholder, as Harvard University doesn't want to be, then you want to do the, the divestment. The divestment for a big company is, is basically a reputational blow. It's not an economic blow, as you know. Um, uh, the whistleblower protection. Now, we've worked hard to get two whistleblower protection laws through and uh, for both corporations and uh, and government officials. And it's, an, it's a constant improvement that's going on. Better and better uh, protection. People want to take their conscience to work should be able to. And it's better if there's an internal protection like an ombudsman and GM of whistleblowers. They don't go public, but they get their dissent registered at the highest levels, and it is registered with the regulatory agency in the say, in this case, Department uh, of, Trans of Transportation. Okay. Uh, it's good to think about how to channel corporations. The most important two ways to deal with big corporations is displacement with cooperatives and community-owned businesses, you know, we talked about earlier, and subordination constitutionally and statutorily to um, real people, the, the rights of real people. And there is an effort now to uh, amend the Constitution to reverse Citizens United and so on. I don't go for that piecemeal stuff. If you're going to go for a constitutional convention, a uh, constitutional amendment rather, go for a vision that deals with the problem generically, not piecemeal. Oh, we, we over overturned Citizens United. you got to go for the whole business. And, and say, look, our Constitution doesn't mention corporation or company. There's been a silent coup d'etat here over time. We're going to make it very clear that only human beings have constitutional rights, and the corporate entity is to be subordinated to the constitutional rights of we, the people. It's really interesting how brilliant the corporate lawyers have been over the last 150 years in terms of corporate uh, domination. When the Massachusetts uh, legislature passed the first chartering laws uh, for the modern corporation, textile mills, look what they did. They put them on a leash. They had to be renewed every couple years for good behavior. They couldn't go into any other business. They couldn't acquire another company. And they were deemed to be operating in the public interest. And then the corporate lawyers started. First, they removed the decision to charter from the legislature to a government agency. That makes it more malleable and less visible. Remember, uh, investors don't start corporations. Investors fund corporations. Corporations are created by government, by state charter and sometimes federal charter, to give them limited liability and perpetual life and all that rules of board of directors. And what's happened is that Delaware began to do the easy, permissive chartering and administering. And so the big corporations went to Delaware, like GM is Delaware, Chrysler is Delaware, Citibank is Delaware. It's not New York or Michigan, because it's a very permissive jurisdiction. It gives a lot of power to the executives and the board of directors over shareholders and over communities and workers. It's a corporate Reno, for those of you who understand that. Remember, Reno was the place where people went to go easy divorces. We call it a corporate Reno. I used to say, I used to say that Delaware, which, which used to get 30% of its revenue from these corporate franchise fees, most half of the big corporations were chartered in Delaware. And I say, you know, GM could buy Delaware in a weekend if DuPont was willing to sell it. <laughs> so they got a very permissive jurisdiction, and they were off to the races. And look how they evolved. First, they evolved because they gave limited liability to the investors. All you lost is what you invested. You didn't lose your home if the company went 
bankrupt. Then they started pushing for limited liability of the corporation itself. The Price-Anderson Law for nuclear power. Workers' compensation. And now they have such a range of limitations that they're, and you know, a lot of them are, are basically hardly pay any taxes, of income taxes. They are, they are moving to make the corporate entity itself immune from more and more legitimate restraints on its misbehavior. And we, that's a big story and sometimes, that, that part of that is what's in this book, uh, People's Business, which is, really goes into it clearly and, and, uh, and very deeply. Uh, so th that's the way we start thinking about these things. And the corporations in your community, you have to think. There are some small communities that basically have declared themselves corporate, uh, uh, corporate free. That is, uh, they, they don't want corporations to have the rights of human beings. So they, they basically say, in this town, only human beings have constitutional rights, not corporations. They can be subordinated. Of course, it doesn't have much legal effect because it, they don't have the primary jurisdiction. The state and federal government will come in if they act in the local and just take it away and preempt, in effect. But it's a very good educational. This is, some of this has happened in Pennsylvania and part of Northern California. It really generates a good discussion in the town council. Yes? I'd like to suggest another way to think about controlling corporations. Yeah. Uh, you stress throughout this weekend the power of the ballot. The yes. power we have as voters. Uh, you also talk about co-ops, which speaks to the other power that we have, yes. which is to spend or to not spend or to change our spending. Yes. Uh, I'd like to mention an application that I don't know how many of you know about it. Uh, I heard about it on the Stephen Colbert show. It turns out his cousin has developed uh, an iPad app called Bycott. Yes. B-U-Y-C-O-T-T. Yeah. Uh, it's not boycott, it's boycott. Yeah. And what it is, is you take it with you on your cell phone, you go into a store, any yeah. store, you look at a product that you're interested in, you flash it at the uh, universal code there, and it will tell you, depending upon the question you ask, it will tell you whether the, uh, those corporate executives overpay themselves, how they treat their employees, right. yeah. uh, and uh, the donations that, uh, that the corporations make. It will give you all of this information, which you can then turn, you use to your advantage to condition your shopping, your spending. Yeah, the power of the consumer dollar. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, that's what I meant by I know, I know, I know. I, I just, that's what uh, I meant by displacement. Just so I'm talking, you know, more tightly about boycotting. Uh, yeah. which is not something that you've spoken to particularly yeah. uh, explicitly. Well, that's a good point. I, I didn't know about bike, bike, bike up. That's good. Uh, I'll look that up and see how, how much it's used. Uh, the boycott, yeah, I mean, you can boycott. It's terrifically labor-intensive to do an effective boycott. And Cesar Chavez, when he did the great boycott, he told me that if they could cut the sales of the grape industry by 4%, they could get a change. They would start feeling it and get a change. Uh, I've never had luck recommending boycotts, and I have recommended boycotts. And it's more difficult than ever now because when you had the NAACP boycott of retailers in southern towns, that really worked because it's very local, and they could just shift. Uh, or the Montgomery bus boycott, that's the most famous one. But if you're trying to boycott a major company like General Electric, it is very hard, and unfortunately, there used to be a, a website of boycotts, by the way. Maybe it still exists, of existing boycotts. Um, but the more boycotts you have, the less effective boycott. You know, they sort of get in each other's way. It's like change.org petitions. Well, unless, unless it builds upon itself. Yeah. I was very surprised when I started researching this uh, recently to discover that uh, Coke Industries actually has 20 easily recognizable uh, consumer items that you find in supermarkets. That's interesting. And, and there is a, a site devoted to uh, boycotting Coke Industries consumer yeah. products. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I was shocked to see. I mean, I didn't think they had anything yeah. that uh, made them. Uh, I'm all for it. It's just, you know, we have limited hours in, in, in terms of a choice. Wow, it is very, 
uh, cable and television, unless you have a really high-profile outrage, you know. Like, I've called for boycott of GM cars. Yeah, good luck. I mean, in all the mess that GM is in now, its sales are increasing. You know. Um, okay, so one last thing. Now, I, I was prevailed against my nature to call this Told You So. This is a collection of my uh, columns. And the reason why my colleague said, you got to call this Told You So, is because of its predictive validity. And if you really connect with re reality, instead of myth, and you try to tell the truth, you're going to become a ac more accurate predictor than the pr proponents of myths and lies. The Iraq War, for example, is an example of that. This has got a lot of good ideas in it that you can develop yourself. And it also talks about successful initiatives and successful civic personalities. So that's, that's and they said, look, all these neocons, they've been wrong, wrong, they've got us into wars, they, they're trying to control the government and in the hands of corporate influence, and they're the ones who are, are getting on the media. And it's about time for our side, progressives and so on, to start saying, we told you so. We told you so that Glass-Steagall's revision is going to create a disaster, a financial disaster. And when Clinton repealed Glass-Steagall, and we testified and wrote against it and wrote letters to Secretary Treasury, and they were ignored, we were right. We were right. But who gets the $200,000 speeches? Alan Greenspan. Even now. You see? That's the sign of a decaying society, obviously, in terms of surrendering power to the unsavory few. Uh, last point before we get to the workshops is uh, th I'm glad Arthur did this. This is really nice. Uh, do you have a copy of this center post? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're very nice to excerpt from uh, 17 Traditions, which is the only book I've ever written that everybody likes. <laughs> so, and, uh, and uh, they, they had to be civically responsible. All right, now there are two young children here. One is nine, right? One is 11. Where are they? Okay, they were brought here by their father from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And they're obviously extraordinary. Look how quiet they've been. <laughs> they've adhered to my parents' first injunction, which is learn to listen. Okay. However, they are absorbing. And their father takes them everywhere. And our parents took us to town meetings, to the county courthouse. When people came to our home for discussions about politics and life, we sat there listening. It was not a child-centric house where you go to somebody's Thanksgiving dinner and three kids are dominating the whole thing, <laughs> under the table, over the table, slobbering around, and the, the adults are just talking about the kids. So we listen. So it says, be civically responsible. That's one of the traditions. And I just want to read you a very short excerpt. As I look back on our society's history on our high points of civic courage and justice, it's clear to me that many of our greatest civic leaders must have been raised to engage with the world around them in just this way. Such values are what drive ordinary people to achieve extraordinary results. And despite my concerns about the future, I am convinced that these natural leaders are still all around us in each new generation, inspired by their sense of justice and eager to bring about change. These are our public citizens, the architects, movers, and sentinels of a functioning successful democratic society. Here's the rub. When I meet these confident, steady, refreshing figures, I like to ask them how they became the people they are, how they developed such drive, such motivation, and such purpose. Quite often, they hesitate. Then they smile. 
And then they respond. Here's their response. Well, when I was young, my parents, my mother, my father, my teacher, my neighbor, told me, took me, showed me, inspired me. For democracy cannot flourish without putting an arm around the shoulders of the young. That's where we have to end up. And we're not doing enough of that. For a variety of reasons, the gap tends to be growing, and we know a lot of the reasons. They're technological, economical, etc. Economic, and uh, we've got to address that. So, so I'm glad to see these two young children with their father, Steve, here, and I think they're old enough to remember it and to uh, benefit from it. So, a little applause for Steve. Yeah. I took Will to Detroit this summer because I wanted to see how easy it is to go from one of the greatest cities in America to a place that's not going to recover. By the way, we spent time at the Art Museum, which is wonderful, and I guess it's going to be saved. I have to tell you, we went on the Ford tour, and I hadn't done it in many years, and Ford Motor Company's done a remarkable job with their factory, and we talked to a lot of the people, but I want to tell you something that you will appreciate. When they opened the factory, they have a a rallying movie that you see at every corporate event. And they actually show, I think it was the 1937 beating up of the Ford Strikers in the black and white film, and when they say, we're not like that anymore. And when the movie ends, not only do they have the Ford Blue Oval, they have the UAW symbol. And I thought that was pretty cool, and I talked to at least 10 people, and they really like the fact that they have a job in Detroit because they're hard to come by. And there seems to be a bit of a spree de corps. I doubt you would see that at GM. Yeah, it's true. They have better uh, labor relations with the UAW. All right, so how do we do this, Arthur? Uh, let me ask you, how many, let me get this list here uh, of the various workshops. Uh, okay, how many of you uh, si signed up on the Cub? Okay, one is the Cub, one is the None of the Above, one is the 10,000 people contributing $30 to start a new advocacy group, one is the $2 club for showing up, one is getting uh, the Free Information Act taught briefly in the schools, and the other is running pets for honorary mayors. And the other is civic training. The other is uh, afternoon, you know, civic training for either adults or children, whatever, or mixed. I mean, students or uh, people who are out of school. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, let's hold off on this because we're going to run short of time here, Steve. Uh, so, how many have signed up for Cub? One, two. Do you, that's the insert, utility bill insert idea, because you're you're getting a huge increase in utility prices here. You received a photocopy of that last night. Yeah, you all got a copy of that Cub. All right, how many? Uh, none of the above. Whoa. Okay, that's good. How many? Uh, Ten thousand people. Ten. Oh, good. Oh, good. How many uh, free information in high school? Oh, good. Wow, this is breaking very nicely. Yeah. <laughs> How many uh, honorary mayor pet? One, <laughs> two. <laughs> I'd have thought that was an easy one. <laughs> this is a really serious audience, let me tell you. <laughs> How many uh, afternoon civic training? Where? Someone here? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you got you got a critical mass. It's working very well except for the pets. But <laughs> it all takes two to make a difference, right? <laughs> all right. So how do you want to do this, uh, Arthur? Do you want to?
Have any of you ever heard of the Progressive Populist newsletter, newspaper? Oh, isn't it great? It started by the Cullen brothers uh, from the Midwest. It was like, I don't know, 1890, you know? They're very progressive guys. One lives in Kansas, one lives in nearby in Texas. They have 10,000 circulation, and it comes out twice a month, and they reprint all the progressive columnists, uh, maybe 30 of them. Some of them you've heard, like Jim Hightower, uh, but a lot of them you haven't heard, and, and they're terrific. And it's a real shortcut to see what the progressive point of view is. And then they have an editorial. And um, I often give it as a gift. Whoops. Uh, I have, yeah, I have a little, uh, I think it's, it's on, that's a key thing here. Uh, it's Progressive Populist, P.O. Box 487, 487, Storm Lake, Iowa, Storm Lake, Iowa, 50588, 50588. And it's a great little gift to give to people who, hey, where's your evidence? What are you talking about? See, uh, I mean, it's a persuader. It, it is really a persuader. Uh, so, progressive, progressive populist. Ronnie Duggar has written for it, Jim Hightower. And uh, uh, so they're making it. They're making a go of it. For those of you who are interested, I have about six where you can fill out the form and get it. Let's do it right now. Anybody particularly want it? Yeah. I think if you want to leave me a blank and a lunch, I can distribute it. Oh, that's good. Okay, great. Uh, they're really good. I mean, it's just kind of like a lot of progressive 19th century, but it's very up to run by a rich family and uh, they just they, sp they spent a lot of money getting on the ballot but it just faded out and their agenda was nothing to cry home about it was like a centrist hybrid but they put 10 million bucks you know getting on ballot and then they 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 blew it I mean they dropped out so it was originally designed to put forward someone that the patriarch the son, he wanted to put him forward visibly for a potential uh, political career. Uh, okay, we've got the, that done. Uh, in terms of materials, you know, I, I think I told you the Citizen's Guide to Lobbying. This came out about 25 years ago. The author is not the head of Common Cause. I made a mistake. It, it's his, the author is Mark Kaplan, who for years headed the Connecticut Citizen Action Group that we uh, started. He's still active. And I have, uh, for those of you who want the citizen training, one of the things that's good is this is a case for the civil jury, the great history. This is the ultimate left-right support. I mean, you've got quotes by people here, historical figures, left-right, going back to Jefferson, Hamilton, you know, you name it. And so people... You know, it's a good thing to get people introduced uh, to the one of the greatest innovations in Western juris jurisprudence. You know, that was number two on the list of protests by our forebears uh, to King George. First is no taxation without representation. Second is you're not taking away our trial by jury of our peers. Uh, you know, in medieval England, that was the that was the bulwark to the tyrant. So. Um, it's very important, and, and the younger generation often doesn't have a clue. 
I just don't have a clue. So that that's uh, by Joanne Dor show. She runs her own group now that we helped start. It's connected with a law school in New York City. It's called Center for Justice and Democracy. And I think the website is centerjd.org. Great reports. You know about that, Matthew? Yeah. You know about Joanne Dora Show's work? Yes, I would have got Yeah. Oh, it's really great. She's, she's doing a wonderful job. She did this when she was with our center. And then I, somebody wanted last dibs on this. Who was it that came up? Yeah, that's the last one. Here. But, but you have to pay for it. And then there's the last one of this one. So if anybody wants that. And uh, this one, which is Told You So, which is very good for, you know, for introducing people to a number of issues in brief fashion. 800, 900, uh, 1,000 words. Okay, so now we're, we can go for, who, who, let's start with the Cub report. Let's see if, if you can hold it to five minutes. Uh, I'm going to take notes if you want to take notes so you cover them all. Uh, who wants to make the presentation for the Cub? Have you appointed uh, someone to come up here? Yeah. Well, why don't you come up here? You got to be very, you know. Let me tell you, you got to be very, very precise because you only got five minutes. Yeah. Come up here. Come up front. Didn't expect this, so I'll I'll wing it. Christine Levitry, live in row, very concerned with the upcoming rate hike of 37 percent. Have felt isolated, but strongly wanting to do something about it. So that was a big part of my motivation of coming here. Um, our conversation switched between two issues, the rate increase and the pipeline. And I think what we've come to realize is they're very interconnected. The one that's necessary and immediate is the rate increase. So I think I feel personally hopeful with connecting with a couple of people I hadn't met to begin to address this issue along with Ralph's information and he sat in with our group and was very, very helpful. So I think the small little group we had of three, four local people is a good beginning. So. Where um, we're going to do a lot of research and figure out where to really start to be able to affect the change. I'm also connecting the moveon.org petition which I just received with 200 signatures. So on a personal level, I'm going to kind of move forward with informing myself of other possibilities and sharing with the group what I find out. And you're going to get two legislatures. Yes, two legislatures immediately involved. And so, and Steve seems to be on that part of it. So, so it feels hopeful. Thank you. <coughs> That's to introduce the bill. It's essentially been drafted. They can just ad adjust it to Massachusetts law. And you've got two very good progressive legislators apparently who will uh, jump to. The next one is the uh, none of the above, no, NOTA. <coughs> Who wants to do that? Okay. None of the above. I'm Susan. I'm Steve. We started out actually having a democratic motion right away. Someone suggested, let's think bigger. Maybe we need a whole compulsory amendment, a whole bill that says you have to vote, it's a federal holiday, and we can put NOTA inside of that. We didn't quite decide whether we should start small or go bigger. Um, and as well, do we start local, state, federal? Again, these were all issues that we were still working out. This pamphlet right here on NOTA is 17 years old. So our first question is what's been happening in those 17 years? We don't know. And our first action would be to call, contact these people and find out what have you learned and you know where to take their knowledge and start from there. To add to that, we also as a group, each of us uh, decided that it would be very important for us to educate ourselves on our local politics, educate, uh, Board of, board of uh, Voting, excuse me, 
uh, rules um, for the county, for the town, for the state, um, so that we could work both top down, federal down, and local bottom up and getting an imbalance. Are you all in Massachusetts or different no. areas? No. No, we're in different areas. And so in terms of emotional intelligence, we thought, how are we going to motivate others? So we asked our own group, why did we pick this particular topic? And so we had um, just a whole host of issues. A lot of people wanted the FU vote. Um, we wanted an actionable vote. People wanted to feel like they were uh, making a difference. It gave them more freedom. It increased their speech. Um, and so that was important for us just to get a sense of why we're here so we can spread that to sort of increase the public will. It's also raised, uh, one of the actions we'll do is to reach out within our, working bottom up, reach out in our communities to find out if this has been acted on by League of Women Voters, by Green Party in the area, have they taken any steps, what, what has already been done in the area so that we don't rehash efforts and we can benefit from their learnings. Yeah, and when we, re we really wanted to try to find out how does it work, the implementation. For example, if someone is basically the none of the above wins, what happens to those other candidates? How many re-elections can you continue to have? Are they, you know, basically in a, do they stay in, does the prior politician stay in that role? We don't know. It's very complicated, so we haven't quite worked those out. But those are the big questions. Um, we know that it's expensive to continue to have re-election. So these are the real challenges. Uh, we just know that the idea of being able to go out there and have your vote count, even if you don't like any of the candidates, matters. It raises the game for the candidates that are on the ballot as well. And another way that we uh, found to identify people in our communities who may be attracted to this issue and might want to sign on to get that 1% was to get a hold of the voter rolls and con reach out to people who did not vote. Registered voters who did not vote. Why didn't they vote? Is it because they're disaffected and they felt their vote didn't count? They may be attracted to this issue. Right. Yes? Did you put like, do like a non-binding referendum just in your area just to get a feel for? Have to do more research, I think. Yeah. Uh, I suggest you contact Richard Winger. Winger? At Ballot Access News. He's the national expert on all things ballot. Ballot Access News? Yes. Thank yes. you. And you can get to him uh, through that website, ballot-access.org. <coughs> San Francisco. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do this one, somebody over here? Yes, sir. Well, uh, in the mid-90s, uh, we worked on a ballot initiative in California for NOTA. It was done by uh, Harvey uh, Rosenfeld at consumerwatchdog.org now. And if you speak to him or Jamie Court, we'll give you more details about that. That was, uh, Ralph was... <laughs> well founded yes, the founded the organization that we tried to get that on the ballot. That was Harvey Rosenfeld? Yeah. What was the organization again? It's now, now called consumerwatchdog.org. Thank you. Uh, they may actually have the uh, ballot. Uh, the ballot initiative, the ballot initiative which, would, which would have been a binding law if it got on the ballot passed in California. That's, that's a very simple note. It would have been for statewide elections. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, no. We oh, did that together. Perfect. Thank you. Good. Thank you all. Laura's, Laura's daughter. Laura's student, right? I am. <laughs> my, my sister Laura, who's taught anthropology at Berkeley for 52 years, Susan was one of her students. And the course was on controlling processes. So I'm sure she would be happy <laughs> when we tell her that. Uh, one other thing we didn't discuss left right was initi initiative referendum recall. That's a big left right. And although the corporations have hijacked it in a number of ways. It doesn't mean we can't use it, and we, we've won a number of them. This is a good one for initiative referendum recall, NOTA. It's good the idea might roll it up into a compulsory voting. It's a higher hill to climb, obviously, but that's for uh, tactical uh, uh, considerations. Second, the third one is the 10,000 people, $30, All right, let's see. Yep, uh, let's see. All right, 
Let's see. Okay, got it. We're on. Yeah, I'm basically, uh, my name is Nick. Uh, Nick Sugar. Obviously, you uh, know the group that we are. I'm just going to summarize, so to speak, what our group did, and just as a representative, so to speak. Um, now, we were charged with, so to speak, coming up with a great advocacy idea, um, or in our case, several, <laughs> um, for getting 10,000 people uh, united, motivated, et cetera, uh, and raising $30 each. The first was an optimization uh, idea suggested uh, by Karen Quinn, which all of us loved and agreed on unanimously, um, and I think, Jack, it's a great suggestion, is that $30 is too high of a hurdle, so to speak, for anything to raise. We felt that 9 dollars or 10 bucks would be a great idea, or even $1, so to speak, and so it's much easier these these days on Facebook and Twitter, in fact, what I'd recommend uh, to your even email list to try to go for $10 a shot per person and get 30,000 people involved. Also, it's better democracy as well. You're getting 30,000 people versus 10,000. So there's a lot of great reasons for that. That's the first optimization we did, no matter what advocacy organization you're starting. And I think all of us can learn from that idea, you know, for whatever group you're in and, you know, you're doing any fundraising or anything like that, shoot for 10 bucks, not 30, go for more people. All right, that's the first great idea. Uh, then beyond that, we have five uh, advocacy great ideas, so to speak, uh, for progressive organization, so to speak. First one, um, going to keep about one minute for each to try to be egalitarian here. Um, we couldn't really decide on one particular. We didn't think that it was enough time. Um, as I said, if there's one smart person, everybody else is kind of you know half wits. That's one thing. We had a lot of smart people, so <laughs> you know, and a lot of smart people here, so it's been really wonderful. Um, so okay, first idea, real quick, is uh, organization I've been working on actually for about four years trying to launch called OptimalHealthLeadership.org. Uh, the website's up, but it's... Yeah, OptimalHealthLeadership.org. Yeah, thank you. It's a nice website. There's not much content, but I plan to accelerate on that. That's why partially I'm here, and thanks to Jack's motivation uh, and all of you here, it's been amazing, and I'm totally, totally fired up to, to go full steam on this. So thank you to all of you. Thanks for this program, and of course, thanks to... Uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph Nader. Um, so uh, we wouldn't be here without him. So anyway, that's uh, an idea. And basically, in, in one or two sentences, without going on too long, since I can go on a while here about that, uh, is it's to unite the top medical doctors, scientists, nutrition scientists, environmental scientists as well, uh, and public health leaders, so to speak, at the Harvard School of Public Health, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg, University of California, San Francisco, like Dr. Dean Ornish over there, uh, and many other international experts, so to speak, in the U.S. and Canada to uh, champion effectively an optimal nutrition program. We already know what the optimal diet relatively is with, you know, 80% agreement on that. Environmentally, we have the worst food system in the history of the world. It's the most toxic food system. We all generally know it. You should know it if you don't. And we need one centralized website, one centralized organization that effectively can work with the media and fight the media misinformation, disinformation is controlled by the corporate lobbies, and also the media loves the controversy, chaos, confusion model. It doesn't benefit anyone. When people get confused. Make no mistake, people make bad decisions with their diet, and they go down the wrong path, and in a year, five years later, they're, they're, they're suffering worsens. So anyway, n enough said on that. Okay, moving along to idea number two. Uh, idea by uh, uh, Steve Parker Field over there, uh, that the wonderful dad who brought his kids. Uh, he had a great idea called uh, Good Book, and I just said goodbook.org. It's an attempt to, believe it or not, and we're not talking small here, his idea is to take on Facebook. So it's, it's not a tiny idea. Um, and the idea is effectively to have a network that would be, work just like Facebook, because Facebook steals a lot of your information, quote unquote steal, and of course they monetize it, uh, and people, most people don't really know that. Go ahead. Ello. Are you familiar with Ello? No, they never heard of it. Vermont? No, never heard of it, really? Yeah. Okay, Ello, how do you spell that? They, they made it, written it into their mission that they will not ever accept advertising, yep. and they will not ever sell user data. It's E-L-L-O. Okay, E-L-L-O. Okay, thank and you. And they just become, they just became a joint public event, uh, Utility, so that even if they get sold or bought, whoever buys them cannot do it either. Okay, do? fantastic. Their business model is that they will network. eventually charge for added functionality. Okay, sure. It's a social network just like Facebook, basically. Okay, thank you so much for that. So obviously someone's already thought of, you know, there are only so many great ideas in the world. Somebody's thought of it. Um, all right, so that was idea number two. Uh, idea number three uh, was thought of by uh, Robert uh, Loeb. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, I called it betterworldlegacy.org, just to give it a name. The idea was effectively, as a, as a dad, he's, every birthday comes around for his son. It's kind of an offshoot on what, what um, you know, Ralph thought of his idea that he tried with Baltimore Sun. And, uh, but it's, I think a, we all felt that it was a better idea, um, actually, and, and it would have more emotional resonance, so to speak, with that. And that was effectively that um, 
every dad or granddad, you know, uh, when the birthday rolls around for their uh, granddaughters, uh, their grandson, et cetera, or their son and daughters can effectively choose to kind of give a gift, rather than giving some material gift, right, something material, possessive, et cetera, to kind of put something in their name and say, hey, let's pick a great organization. What do you like? You know, or that could get the kids involved, right? One of the things we ended with, uh, how do you get kids involved? How do you get them to become activists and get passionate about making the world a better place? It's a great way to get them involved, get them excited, um, and get the dads. If they're too young, obviously, the dad, you know. Moms. Yeah, yeah. Right. grandmothers. Yeah. Sure, exactly, yeah. I mean, any, anybody, of course, with a you know, son, daughter, granddaughter, anybody could get involved to do this. It's a great, great way, again, to, to teach, uh, to mentor. Uh, you know, it's something we all really need to be doing that are the parents or grandparents. So it's a great idea. We, we love it. Um, and uh, then uh, Steve added on an idea that is kind of a separate idea, so I kept it as a separate idea. It's not really... That's Ford, that's right, uh, that's Ralph. Um, uh, so yeah, the fourth idea is uh, I call it the Vanguard uh, Better World kind of gift investment account. Um, and there are some ideas like that investment world, but this is, I'm not sure anything exactly like this exists. It might already exist. Um, but anyway, I'll spell out what the idea is. And he just thought the Vanguard would be interested in doing it, which I tend to agree as used to be investment researcher, so I've experienced with them. Um, and there are other social responsible companies actually that would definitely be interested in this actually, even better, more, more than Vanguard. And that, the idea would be that you, when your son, daughter, granddaughter, whoever, grandson is born, you put like 100 bucks in a little mutual fund account and then you designate like a couple percent you know, of that or whatever it is that could be flexible uh, to be given, so to speak, to a particular charity that you like. Uh, it could be any particular charity that you choose or maybe a list of charities, that kind of thing. And of course, that way in perpetuity, not only would the investment grow over time, but if it's automatic, you know, automatic uh, gifting to the particular charity. And when the son, daughter grows up, they get to see, oh, I've been contributing to this charity. I've been making the world a better place. They get to feel good about it. You know, kind of like planting a tree, kind of similar uh, philosophy. All right, that's idea number four. Okay, number five. Uh, is an uh, idea presented by Richard uh, Pilkington uh, back there, and um, that's what we call the local for idea. Um, and uh, it's, it could be a website, a centralized website, or an app actually would be optimal as well. And to uh, accumulate, so to speak, gather in one place, and nothing like this exists, and it could be you know, one local for site that kind of almost like a Craigslist, but uh, to think of it that way, but for each particular state or particular city, and effectively, you would have a centralized uh, map and say, oh, here are the local state parks, libraries, here are the particular co-ops, you know, in the particular area, people may even aware, oh, wow, we have enough co-ops. You know, we didn't even know we had this many co-ops in the area. There's one not too far from me. Maybe I should visit it. You know, so that's a great idea. And also, it gets people, farmers markets, CSAs, you know, should be included in that, obviously, to encourage the whole local for idea. And obviously, any other stuff of interest to, you know, that particular community could be easily added on. Uh, so uh, that, again, could be a website, and ideally, it'd be very easy to turn that into an app as well. I'm, I'm absolutely confident about it. So that's it. Those are our five ideas, and I'm going to hand the mic uh, back up to Ralph. Okay, thank you. you can just put that. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. They're good ideas, but they didn't hit the main point I wanted them to hit, which is how do you get 10,000 or 30,000 people? So, but they're good ideas, you know. Serendipity. Uh, four. FOIA in schools. Who wants to do that? Okay. All right. So we had we had the Freedom of Information Act group. The Freedom of Information Act is simply a federal law that also has state laws underneath it in most cases. Uh, sure. I'm Matt Weatherington. I'm from Atlanta. Uh, so Freedom of Information Act allows you to get certain documents and information from the government. Uh, you have to specifically request the documents, uh, but not a cate but not necessarily. I want document number X Y Z. You could just say I want the report on X Y or Z. So, it's, for example, you want to know about nursing home abuse reports. You would just say, Can you give me all your documents about nursing home abuse at this nursing home over the last two years, and send that to the police department or whatever federal agency regulates that. So, our charge from Ralph was to get the Freedom of Information Act into schools uh, through whatever means we come up with. And Claire Nader was in our group and shared with us a success model that's been working for 22 years now in Winston, Connecticut. And what they will do is have a lawyer come into the school and present to the children, 
This is what the Freedom of Information Act is. Here's how it works. Here's the types of information that you can obtain. Here's how you put your rights into action. And we'll actually have the students compose the Freedom of Information Act request and submit it to the appropriate agency and get back information. And the students will also write an essay and can also, uh, it was another thing they would do, but in the end they would be, huh? Yes, they would get a prize at the final assembly at the end of the year, some monetary prize for the merit of their essay or the work that they performed. So following Claire's model, we've got 10 members in our group, and we now have 10 members who have committed to give at least 10 presentations in our local schools. Uh, so at a minimum, we've got our core group of 1% who are going to start doing something. We're going to partner with our local trial lawyers organizations and or government organizations who know a lot more about FOIA than, FOIA than maybe our individual committee members and also would be able to help have a personal interest in making sure it happens, whether it's for publicity reasons or getting, getting into the community themselves. Uh, so we'll, we'll be teaching the FOIA to the students. We've also uh, in, implemented an accountability model. We're going to, we have an email flowing around. We'll follow up in a couple of months to make sure that the members of the group are actually doing this. And if not, you know, what are the barriers and how can we get through them? So that's happening. Yes, sir. Quick question. What grade level um, are you targeting? You know, it was kind of across the board. It seems like there's not a single person of any age that would not benefit from knowing their rights and how the Freedom of Information Act works. So I would say anything over fifth grade where you can read and write. Uh, it seems to be that this would benefit them to learn. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you, guys. Sure. Uh, Ralph asked me to disclose information about uh, other things that have been disclosed in the past. Uh, what context? Anything that succeeded in getting... The VA was forced to release their entire software package for their electronic health record system under a FOIA request. It's now the basis of um, electronic medical records uh, across the United States uh, for community hospitals, for low-cost hospitals. Uh, uh, India has now adopted it uh, in about 50% uh, of the provinces, and the nation of Jordan has now adopted VISA, again, uh, generated by the VA, released by FOA, uh, uh, the FOIA Act, and now open source, and the, the entire nation of Jordan has now adopted it. And the mm. Indian Health Service uses just uh, A version of it, yes. all the community yeah. health centers in Michigan <coughs> open source. It, for those of you who aren't familiar with FOIA, I want to be crystal clear on this. There are very limited exceptions to the types of information that you can't access. It generally falls under, you know, security, and personal information. You can't ask for someone's you know, tax return, but everything that you own is publicly available, publicly accessible. You just have to ask for it. So if you want to know about, for example, Michelle deals with this constantly, what pollutants are in your local water, just ask your local environmental agency. And, or in, if they don't know, they'll direct you to the federal agency. I mean, the information is there. People just aren't exercising the rights that they have. And this is a step in the right direction, and thank you for giving us an opportunity. Thank you, Matt. By the way, anyone in the world can use our Free Information Act. And, and I'll give you an example. In Canada, where they didn't have a Free Information Act, they had a group of law students who were monitoring meat and poultry act, uh, plants. And so we told them, since there was an agreement between the U.S. and Canada to have inspectors because there was trade across boundaries, so Canadian meat would come here, we had USDA inspectors there. Therefore, the USDA had inspection reports about Canadian plants, so they put a Free Information Act request to the USDA from Ottawa. They got the inspection reports, and they gave it to the media, and it was all over the media of the dirty meat plants in Canada. So it's, it's a remarkable uh, law in the sense of who can use it and its endless uh, uh, benefits. As Matt said, there are a number of exceptions, uh, internal investigation, something is uh, under internal investigation in an agency they, they escape. They try to use the exceptions to block you. There are all kinds of lawsuits that we, we and others have brought 
uh, to narrow the unbridled discretion of the agency to, to say no, and it continues on. So the next one is, oh, the next one I'm going to have to do myself in my hometown. I'm going to get an um, uh, honorary pet to be mayor. <laughs> and you're going to, okay, and you're going to do that, okay. Oh, you are? Oh, okay. You're doubling up. Come on up here, Carol. Uh, uh, it's on the election of the pet slash fundraiser, um, <clears throat> Carol Miller, New Mexico, and I spend a lot of time fundraising and writing grants and everything else, and the reason I like this is that our community center used to have a raffle, and it's a lot of work, so I'm going to propose at our next board meeting that we do the honorary mayor election. We have no elected representatives. We're unincorporated, a town of 300, and... Ralph's right, people will do more for their pets. I try and raise money for children's books and I think the pets will raise more money. So we're gonna have an election and then we're gonna pressure specific people to, I mean the whole irony of buying the election is the part I like. It really, it really like opens the window where we can go to someone whose little nipper dog bites me every time I go over to their house say, we'll let her be the mayor Honorary mayor, if you give $100, you'll probably have the most votes. But it's just a way to really do something fun, and that's what's so great to me about this one. We're so serious all the time, and it's so such a struggle to keep the doors open, but I think this will actually raise some money. And I think it'll be copied in a lot of places across New Mexico. The Our food distribution, I run a, a food bank and work with a network of food banks. We now get pet food through the food distribution system so that people can have food for their pets. And there are more donors to that right now than food for humans. So it just lets us really talk about a lot of issues. So I'm definitely doing it. We'll have our first honorary mayor. And I hope it's a goat. <laughs> hope it's a goat. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the goats are being unleashed now to uh, do what uh, machines spout in fossil fuels do in terms of clearing land. Um, or the last one is uh, civic training clubs or afternoon clubs. So. <laughs> the triumvirate. Yes. And guess why we are breaking the, uh, the house rules? <laughs> we are breaking the house rules because with our, without our kids, we have no future. And mm -hmm. I hope that you all agree. So I'm going to present the part on the little kids. Uh, you will present the part on the high school kids, and she will add whatever we make. <laughs> so you are. I'm Mariola, and I live in Chestnut Ridge. And I want to ask you a question if you know who Janusz Korczak is. How many of you know who Janusz Korczak is? No. He was the father of children's rights before the UN uh, adopted it in 1929. And how many of you know that the United States did not ratify Children's Convention? You know? And you know who is the partner in crime with the United States? Perfect. It was Somalia and Sudan, <laughs> and now it's Somalia. Perfect. Okay, those are the only two countries in the world. So, what are we going to do for the kids? I have worked for many years trying to convince schools to bring something that I call five-star program to the kids, allowing four minutes of movement before academic or any other type of activity. Four minutes, and I have not been successful. I have right now one pilot in, my, in one of the schools in Rockland County, and I'm having a lot of problems with the three teachers who are not doing the program. The kids want it, but they are not doing it. So the idea is to do it outside of school, an after-school program, and I'm doing one program right now in the local library for the Latino and African American children who get nothing in school when it comes to art, and music, or research. Why is this program important? Because it allows the child to decide if they are paying attention or not. After the four minutes of movement, they sit down and do the work for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, they assess, am I paying attention to Mrs. Smith? And if they are not paying attention to Mrs. Smith, 
they are supposed to be allowed to raise their hands and go to the table on the side uh, that we call take a break area and have a break. And they can do whatever they want, look through the kaleidoscope, touch something hard, uh, do some movements, whatever, one to three minutes, and then come back. <laughs> Schools, you think that it's easy to bring something like this to school? It benefits the teacher and it benefits the, the kids? No way, okay? Really obstacles. So after school, we started it in the library, in the local library. I know that I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. And uh, we had 50 kids signed up. Within a week, we had 100 kids signed up. This is my local little town with 25,000 Orthodox children who go to yeshivas whose parents cut our school budget and 90 public school, 9,000 public school kids that I'm working with. So our program was closed because we couldn't um, do more. So three weeks later, we received, we received the new building where we can start doing the program. The part of the civic, what I've learned here, what I want to introduce is that after the kids are finished with the homework, they are going to start learning how to answer the questions about what rights they have. Children don't know in the United States that they have rights. So I want to show them what kind of rights they can have, and I want to also ask them the question, what they would like to change at school? What do they like and what they don't like? And we can vote on that. So that's for the small children, and we will have the pet awards, because I think that for little kids from three to seven, it's a great idea to learn how to vote through that. Sorry. <laughs> and in high school, we want to, um, or middle, beginning in middle school, have uh, mock votes of local elections and national elections and have them before the actual election. Uh, so the kids have to think about who they would vote for and then compare their voting to the result of the town. But we also thought they could uh, have ballot initiatives within the school that would be about the issues the kids have with their school community. Do they want different food in the cafeteria or do they want something else available at recess or, you know, what are the initiatives that they could use balloting in the high school for their mock elections to actually practice making things happen through voting? Excuse me, uh, would you tie that into their student body elections? Yes, yes, and definitely. And also we talked about uh, identifying the social studies teacher who has a civics curriculum that we could uh, supplement and work with her because we know we can't change the curriculums. If you speak to social studies teachers, you might get in touch with the FOIA group because we are going to go through social studies teachers. That yeah. would be a tremendous yeah. help. Uh, I'm Rachel. Hello. So, um, as you can see, we got into some detail, but the, the general uh, consensus, I believe, is that uh, by, by showing, uh, special, well, starting with young people, but uh, adults too, how uh, to use, to become comfortable with voting process and regular meeting rules, that how you can make change, and so that we would uh, prefer to have that, uh, incorporate that as part of the regular school curriculum rather than an after-school program. So one of uh, our plans, I think, well, speaking for myself, I'm going, my first move would be to find out what's happening at our local schools find out which classes are responsible for this kind of activity, see if they have time to do it or if they feel it could be done better, uh, that maybe we could form a coalition uh, with interested citizens, but also to reach out to existing uh, organizations in the town who may also be very interested in encouraging this, such as the American Legion or the Kiwanis uh, or the Grange or um, Rotary. Why there's many, many, there's many, many groups that already exist, and and programs. I feel that most of them, uh, we all felt that most of them would be very interested in this, and so that really very swiftly builds a base of support that maybe uh, the school uh, teachers or the, or the school board uh, would be supported in expanding this program if we feel it was insufficient, and, and uh, also addressing the uh, retirees possibly in town who may want to make a contribution if finances are required, uh, and then maybe we would uh, make prizes or pizza parties, have some, in, this, in, in the case of the school children, some concrete um, effect for their vote, that they see visible change if they're voting on something, and uh, that maybe they get a reward as well. 
but that was, uh, I think, our most important thing was that with young people, make sure that if a vote is taken, the change is visible and to not get into politics uh, in the early days so that they are not copying their parents' vote necessarily on a candidate, but it is something different. And maybe it would be a, uh, their a mascot was a great idea. So maybe, so that was just one of our little ideas. So that is what we've, uh, so, and we're hoping, thank you. <laughs> and, thank you. So, and I should say, I'm ready to top up my $30 right now if you <laughs> want to start. Okay. Uh, this is great. You see the, uh, how much was done in less than an hour? Pardon? Oh, there is, I'm, how can I forget that? Okay. <laughs> The, the two dollar was that skipped? Okay, who wants to do that? Okay, Margaret Walsh, the citizen troubadour. Hi guys, um, would the uh, row two dollar club stand up? Yay! So um, I'm going to start with sort of um, a, the traditions. We're going to speak our community's language, and um, we will keep showing up to each other at least to our club members. We've come up with a three-step commitment. First, we're going to agree that we, I'm going to take off these glasses. Uh, first, we agree that we will, we need more people to show up. So to be in the $2 club, you agree that we need more people to show up and speak up, either in, uh, speak up for the common good, for, speak up for civic duty, Navy, neighborhood is a variable term. So um, if they have, could you follow that? And then the second is um, we're going to agree to show up regularly to do your civic duty or to do the common good or to do something for your neighborhood, the same variable. And the third agreement is to um, meet up and build skills and define agenda for either the common good, the civic duty, the neighborhood, the variable term. I, I uh, meant to uh, do this part first, but it's why we chose this um, group. One was uh, new to a neighborhood. It would be a good way to meet and discuss anything. Um, and um, the main issue would be, uh, it's a community with lots of media people. And uh, uh, focus on the relevance of the press. Another was uh, uh, the logistics, boots on the ground, the Occupy, simple, the numbers. Another is a problem in the country, the lack of civil action. Um, it had, has had gatherings in the past, organized with discussions and brought in speakers. And uh, uh, needs to think of ways to get more people to show up and uh, give feedback. And then uh, another was uh, we need a tool to instigate civil, civic action, um, inspire, again, instigate efficiently civic action. Another one, um, uh, the major election, was disappointed by the major election, by the turnout, and um, the people who uh, met uh, the mandatory voting uh, issue. Um, and instituting mandatory voting locally instead of going uh, nationally. And, um, you know, I heard Ralph talk about this last Saturday. So uh, this is my personal experience in Newburgh, New York, hanging out. I found out that they raised the property tax 72%. And people who had modest homes lived and paid their taxes. But when their taxes doubled, the city took their homes. So there are blocks not far from Main Street that are houses, beautiful old houses boarded up. And they're putting up chain link fences and these old guys are sitting on the stoop of a duplex that was remodeled but has been condemned. And they're just putting lots. So I'm, I've been kind of talking to these guys trying to call it outside agitator. But when I came back with the $2 club in the back of the $2 bill and risking uh, they thought they were signing their death sentence, quoting as much as I can remember, recall from Ralph. They sparked up and they actually stood up. And um, so 
That's one $2 club for me. And the other one is Tito on the corner who sells hot dogs. He says he's going to work outside the system and get rich. And he's in another $2 club. So it's just, you know, for me, it's just provoking people to get engaged. They don't have $2. They don't have two cents. And they don't talk. They don't have two minutes or two words, whatever. I'm embellishing. But I'll um, go really quickly over these. Uh, to be in the uh, $2 club, you agree that uh, we need more people to show up. That's all you got to do to be in the club is agree that we need more um, people to show up and speak up. Um, and you'll agree to show up regularly to speak up, show up and speak up. And uh, you agree to uh, meet as a club to build skills and define agendas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Uh, uh, look what's come out of just an hour, you see, and the predicate of what we've done in a year and a half. Now, the key is to go beyond the pilot project, to go beyond the successful one instance here or there, scale it up and refine it so it starts becoming contagious and spreads. And, you know, we've had that in our past, right? There was a, a Girl Scouts, uh, one. There was the Boy Scout, one, and they started, and they spread all over the country, the Grange, for example. How did they do that? They did that because the original model hit a chord that was common all over the country. Hit a chord, hit a need, uh, hit a value that was uh, recognized all over the country. But they also did it in another way. They learned from the first success and refined it, where had rough edges, didn't quite work as well. They refined it. To take an invidious example, the first McDonald's was in, near Chicago. And, uh, uh, and uh, they, they learned from the first McDonald's what worked, what didn't work. They started three, four more. And they learned what worked and didn't work. How do you look for the location? How do you do portion control? How you hire people? How do you promote? And the more they learned, they went like 1 to 3 to 10 to 30 to 60. So they were setting one up, you know, like every day around the country. Um, and, and because they knew exactly what problems they were going to confront because they had overwhelmed them, and as they moved forward, they confronted fewer problems. And they became more, quote, efficient. Now, when I was in the Army, and I was in basic training. We had a tough sergeant, but he had a real wit. And here's one way he motivated us. He said, listen, guys. Oh, he actually called us men. Imagine we've lost the word men. Everything is guys. And men and women are guys now, right? Uh, it's okay to use the word women, but they took it away from us. Men. Imagine using the word men. Um, anyway, he said, men, he says to us, I mean, we just finished running with our backpack like we were panting. Let me tell you something. The Army is a system devised by geniuses so it can be run by idiots like you. <laughs> and I thought that was a profound comment. <laughs> In other words, it, it was devised by geniuses organizationally, but they made it easier and easier and easier with the lesson plans and all the instructions to participate. And so they lowered the barrier of entry in terms of difficult to perform or to participate. We're not talking about the battlefield, and the, the regular, you know, operations of the Army, the routine things. And so that's what we want to do to scale. I mean, the idea, this will only succeed if you do it in a way that other people in other communities nearby or afar say, wow, this is good, let me know. That's why the NOTA manual is so important, you see, because that overcomes one hurdle. Not all the hurdles, it overcomes one hurdle. What's the action plan? Here it is, news, news release, <clears throat> et cetera. How do you draft it and the like? So always think of scale, because this country is full 
of pilot projects that succeed. There's an inner school that's doing very well. Okay, why doesn't it spread? Uh, what, what are the variables that cannot be repeated? So you want to develop a system that's very replicable and becomes better and more replicable with time as it spreads and it becomes more numerous in communities. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, they have it at a level of detail and organization. It's absolutely staggering. There's hardly anything they haven't thought of except boycott. <laughs> yes? That seems to be a common theme within the activist world. Um, and I don't know if it's, it's because of our distaste for the corporatism. Yeah. Um, but we fail to latch on to the things they've done that have succeeded. They're marketing, they're strategizing, they're planning. They, it works. Yeah. That's why they're winning, because yeah. it works. Yeah. We don't have to reinvent the wheel with everything we do. We should be taking hold of the things that they're doing yeah. that are getting them out there and grabbing onto those and using them for good things, and it's it's a struggle. I have a very hard time yeah. getting other activists to try to, to do that. They, they have such a distaste for, for what's been done with it that they throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, you're right. Some activists lo look at organization as an enemy, as, as a front, an insult. Heaven forbid, you know, dis discipline and coordination and leadership. Uh, the reason why the corporations win so often is just pure organization. Uh, and you know, we outnumber them. Uh, we have common values and pursuits, but you don't organize, you don't get it. But she's right, there's a lot of that response. Yeah. People, anti but you have to be prepared to respond to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, you, you know, you, and also you get the best practices. Right. right. You get the best practices of corporations. In most industries, there are some smaller companies, medium sized social venture network, you know. The f former Ben and Jerry's, Esprit, Patagonia. I mean, you use those to hurl against the conglomerates that, uh, you know, think that's the way to, to behave when it isn't the way uh, to behave. All right, well, we we're, we're have to wrap up now and go to have a dinner. And uh, always remember, we're, we're there to help you and each one uh, to push it forward. Uh, I didn't give you all the materials we could, we could give you because, you know, that's, uh, but we do have some back at the office and uh, feel free, and there's no copyright on any of this stuff, so feel free to make copies. And by the way, the Freedom of Information Clearinghouse is all online. So it's Public Citizens Freedom of Information Clearinghouse and just uh, tap into it. If you have a particular FOIA and you are turned down, there is a possibility that you'll get pro bono representation by our lawyer. Uh, I mean, they usually operate at the federal level, so they, they don't often take a, a state. Uh, but we brought more lawsuits under the FOIA than anybody in, in the country. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, Steve has an offer. He's going to give everyone here a, a week's free link to his uh, co-op uh, DVD. Okay, thank you.